After we have heard a lot of uh, building up referral networks and uh, uh, sophisticated recipes how to put the device in, we now have to cope with the post-implantation uh, follow-up and the pharmacological strategies. Uh, these are my disclosures, uh, well balanced. And uh, what I want to discuss with you is, uh, um, first of all, as a brief introduction, what uh, summarizes what are our challenges for the post-device uh, follow-up. Um, then, of course, um, uh, how we perform the post-implant follow-up and uh, discuss some pharma strategies. There are several pharma strategies that have been suggested by several authors and uh, provide an outlook into the future and, and, and propose uh, some personal opinions that we may discuss. So I think this has been addressed by all the speakers. Just briefly summarize it again. I think we're, uh, when we're talking about patients who are indicated uh, or who, uh, yeah, who we treat with LA occlusion, we have to be aware that most of these patients deal with some chronic forms of atrial fibrillation and are certainly not ideal candidates for other treatment options such as atrial fibrillation. So these patients live with atrial fibrillation and they're the only uh, thing we need to t take care about is uh, the deleterious uh, complications that might occur in, in terms of thromboembolism. And as you can see from the, the data that Professor Park uh, shared with us in, in 2011, we see that the, uh, most of them have a bleeding history, are intolerant or contraindicated to warfarin, or have had a, 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 had, had a stroke on warfarin. And in addition to that, uh, I summarize it again. Um, we, we addressed it, as I, as I mentioned. They, most of them have a high has blood or so a high bleeding risk. They are uh, certainly old. Um, uh, some of them have renal failure. And um, um, some of our patients have the need for a prolonged uh, medication with dual platelet inhibition, uh, for example, after stent placement. So these are the patients, high bleeding risk, and we certainly want to avoid a long-term treatment with anticoagulation after an implantation of, the, of uh, an LAA occlusion device. Uh, so uh, uh, considering this, we need to outweigh the patient's bleeding risk against their uh, need for uh, preventing uh, thromboembolic complications. We certainly need to determine the optimal time frame for the po post-device uh, uh, treatment and, um, uh, or pharma intervention, and we need to choose the ideal agents. Um, and uh, finally, this will result in developing long-term strategies that help us to utilize as few healthcare resources as possible. So, what is important during post-implantation follow-up? I think the, the, the most important tool to perform post-implantation follow-up is certainly transesophageal echocardiography. And what kind of questions do we answer with this uh, intervention? So first of all, we check for device location. Is it still there? Uh, we check for device patency. Does it really seal the left atrial appendage? And then uh, did a thrombus uh, develop on this foreign body that we have implanted into the left atrium. And um, it's certainly, uh, according to our experience, it's certainly not enough to just make a phone call and ask if the patient is feeling all right, uh, because uh, as you can see from this example, this is a 60-year-old female. Six weeks after an implantation, she came to our outpatient clinics and was feeling fine and was happily looking forward to discharge clopidogrel medication. But then our echocardiographer almost fainted when he saw this, uh, a dancing device in the left atrium. And because we don't have a very good relationship to cardiac surgeons, um, we tried to take it out ourselves. And... Uh, just to keep you uh, alive during this pr procedure, I will show you the final result at the end of this presentation. So this is uh, um, a, a very interesting image of a dancing device. Fortunately, 30 millimeters in size, so it cannot pass, uh, go through the mitral valve and cannot embolize into, um, uh, into any organ. Okay, so now, most importantly, we, dis we addressed this issue already. We need to talk about the optimal pharmacological strategies after a, an LAA occlusion implantation. And I have to uh, 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 address that most of the data that I'm showing to you has been uh, um, uh, gathered with watchman devices. Uh, 
um, and we can discuss this if both devices have, uh, 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 or, or, or if the devices are different for pharmacological strategies. So the, I think the, the most prominent uh, study that we are aware of is the Protect AF trial and the post-implantation pharmacological strategy is displayed here. So patients after implantation were kept on oral anticoagulation for 45 days, then a TEE was performed and if there was no thrombus on the device, patients were switched to dual antiplatelet therapy for another six months and after another TEE um, um, showing no thrombus, patients were switched to monotherapy with aspirin lifelong. Um, so um, if we I, we have heard about the efficacy of the device, but looking into the safety, we can see this is the Watchman um, uh, device group here in the, in the Protect AF trial. Of course, we, we are all aware that there were uh, um, approximately 7% of procedural complications, but then most of the complications occurring later were bleeding complications, of course. And if you look at this curve carefully, you see that most of the uh, po um, uh, complications during follow-up occurred in this first time period may be or probably associated with warfarin treatment and uh, later on with dual platelet inhibition. And then there is a flattening of the curve, it, it runs parallel, and then only later on there are a few um, more complications, certainly with less patients at risk here, uh, giving bigger steps in the curve. So if we look at this in another format as a table, you, uh, we can break it down to the, 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 the several uh, stages of the trial. And if you look at the first 45 days with warfarin treatment, we experienced 1.3% bleeding complications, which translates into an annual risk of around 10% uh, um, bleeding complication rate. And then after switching the patients to dual platelets, this is reduced to 1.6% per year, and beyond one, uh, day 180, there occurred 1.9% complications. I cannot, or we couldn't calculate the annual risk because uh, we missed the follow-up. So certainly, we don't like this strategy. The bleeding risk is still too high. So uh, Professor Schumacher from Germany suggested a different strategy in patients with a high HASBLAD score, uh, so a high bleeding risk, and he changed the post-implant strategy to aspirin therapy plus uh, a sub-Q low molecular weight heparin for eight weeks. Then he performed a TEE and switched the patients to ASA monotherapy. And uh, the data has not been published yet in a full, full version, but the data that I have shows you that this is certainly also a high-risk population with a high HASBLAD score. Um, and he had very high implant success. He's an experienced operator. Again, only Watchman devices uh, implanted in this, in this study. And he had uh, uh, a relatively low bleeding rate following this strategy with 3.4%. Um, uh, however, I don't know if this is throughout the whole follow-up. Um, I just can guess this. Um, in patients contraindicated to warfarin, um, the, the, the other option is to choose dual antiplatelet therapy without any intervention in the plasmatic coagulation cascade. And um, this is also data that you are probably aware of is uh, coming from the ASAP registry study, um, uh, including or enrolling patients with atrial fibrillation, a CHAT score of more than one, and who, are, who were contraindicated to oral anticoagulation. And those patients were treated with dual antiplatelet therapy for six months. A TOE was performed, and uh, then patients were switched to aspirin monotherapy. And if we look at the uh, the patients at first, again, uh, relatively old patients with a high CHAT score and a high implant success, very experienced operators again, Vivek Reddy, Peter Zick, and, and others. And um, the efficacy and safety data that we are interested in uh, is shown here. They had a relatively low ischemic stroke rate of 1.7%, um, uh, which shows that this is probably a feasible way of, um, uh, of antithrombotic regimen after the implantation. Uh, but they still had a bleeding complication rate of 4%. If we break it down again into the uh, different stages of the trial, we, we can see that the bleeding rate in the, in the dual antiplatelet, uh, 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 or during the stage where dual antiplatelet was prescribed, uh, is, uh, or, or, or uh, uh, summarizes to an annual risk of 6.6%, which is still quite high. 
Um, and uh, if you compare it to the active W trial, where it was 3.1% is certainly relatively high. However, maybe patient population is a little different here. So, but this, uh, this data um, um, was, for us, uh, uh, was an ignition, so to speak, to, to change that approach and to shorten the time period in which we apply dual antiplatelet therapy. And our strategy at CCB in Frankfurt uh, is to apply dual antiplatelet therapy for six weeks only. And then we perform a TE and change the patients, switch the patients to aspirin monotherapy in, in the absence of a thrombus on the device. We have uh, retrospectively found uh, a comparator group that we left on oral anticoagulation because those patients were on oral anticoagulation at the time of implantation. So we said, okay, we just leave it and stop it after six weeks if the TE is fine. Um, what were the results? So in this group, certainly less patients, only 19 patients in this group, and 52 patients in this dual antiplatelet arm. And you can see there are no major differences in their risk score. Relatively old patients, high CHADSVAS score, high HASBLAT score. And what you can see, and this was really striking, is that the rate of thrombus formation after six weeks of dual platelets is very, very low. It's only 1.7%. As opposed to that, we found a relatively high incidence of thrombus formation if only oral anticoagulation is applied. However, I wouldn't refer to the number. This is certainly a very small group, but what the, the, the major information from this slide is that dual antiplatelets for six weeks appears to be associated with a very low thrombus formation rate on the device. And um, during follow-up, after discharging clopidogrel, um, you see that 97% of our patient population were off oral anticoagulation or off clopidogrel after 14 weeks. Um, we have had no TIA or stroke within the first 12 months post-implantation. There were two deaths for heart failure during follow-up and two bleedings on aspirin monotherapy. So that is, I think, the major point here. Can we get rid of aspirin after having uh, implanted a device, and this is certainly, um, uh, has to be discussed, and what we are proposing as a study protocol is shown here. We would love to do, with all of you, the STOP ASA study, uh, having patients enrolled who undergo an LA occlusion procedure at first are randomized to six weeks or six months of dual antiplatelet therapy to get an information whether six months is really necessary or not. So at, at six months, uh, a TE will be taken, and if there's no thrombus, uh, or, and the incidence of thrombus will be compared. And um, uh, next, all patients who do not have a thrombus on their device will be randomized again to aspirin lifelong or no therapy. And then we, will, uh, we would love to look for um, 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 uh, hard clinical endpoints. So I would love to discuss that with you. And uh, as a conclusion, my recommendation, it's a personal recommendation, not a guideline, is that we in our clinical setting uh, recommend to apply dual antiplatelets for six weeks. We then perform a TEE to assess for stroke. We discharge the clopidogrel in the absence of stroke. And if eligible, we also stop aspirin therapy, but the experience here is very limited. Thank you very much for your attention. And this is now the harvest. So uh, I promised to show you this. So what we did with this dancing device is to bring in a mitra clipping sheath, 24 French, and we uh, snared the device and, uh, with two snares and finally could manage to crop it into the uh, into the transeptal sheath and we avoided uh, referral to the surgeon. Thank you very much. <laughs>